And the way we grew up, Jerome, which was first grade, get excited, go to second grade, get excited, go to third grade, fourth grade, junior high, high school, man, I got to get into college now. That's the next thing I'm supposed to do. You get into college. Oh, I got to go get that corporate career. That's the next thing I'm supposed to do. You do that. Man, I got to get me a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You, you, you make that happen. Got to get married now because that's what everybody else is doing. You do that, and then you end up having two and a half kids, a white picket fence, and a dog, and you're in debt and broke. Nonsense. It's complete <laughs> nonsense. You don't and believe in the fairy tale, huh? There's no fairy tale. That's, that's all marketing, and that's a ploy. It's all marketing and a ploy. Fam- Thanks, family. Y'all for tuning in to Dreamcatchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self motivated individuals who desire to take their life forward to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dreamcatchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and I got the great pleasure of interviewing Maurice Philogene today. Maurice, how are you, man? Good, man. What's going on, Jerome? Good to see you again. Great to see you, man. I I met Maurice in Boston, and I didn't really get to meet him. I kind of did a car drive-by. So he was on stage. uh, He was (laughs) participating in the Shark Tank, and after he came off stage, uh, he had a line wrapped around the stage. So I just walked up, handed him my car, and said, man, let me catch up with you later. And he was gracious enough to take my call the following week. And here we sit today getting ready to share his story. And guys, you're getting a special treat. This is Maurice's yeah, first podcast. So he's got a great story and message. And I'm just excited to be able to share it with you guys. So with that, I didn't do a great job of introducing you, man. Will you give the listeners a little bit about your background and what your current focus is? Yeah, so uh, my name is Maurice Philogene. I live in Washington, D.C., or at least the area. Um, Grew up in Boston. Was born in New York, but grew up in Boston and then went down to UVA, University of Virginia, down in D.C. area, and have been based out of there ever since. Um, Since uh, graduating from UVA, I've been an exec at a consulting firm. I'm still there for 22 years, but, um, and also an uh, officer in the Air Force uh, military. So that's been kind of the stable of my, my professional background. But uh, Jerome, as you alluded to, um, I kind of got involved in real estate back in 2002 and then have built, uh, built a bit of a foundation from it. And now I kind of focus on all, all those three aspects. Um, so my professional career is a bit diverse, but that's, that's the general background. Sweet, man. So tell me what, what drew you to real estate? I mean, this isn't a real estate podcast, but anytime I get on the line with a fellow investor, I I love to find out what got them in. I mean, 2002, you know, it's right after the tech bus, but before the great recession. So, I mean, you've seen a few cycles. What, what about real estate? Um, made you want to come in and start putting your dollars there? Yeah, so uh, I fell into it backwards, ass backwards, actually, just to be honest. I bought, um, actually, I remember being in New York with with a family. I picked up a book. You remember those pers- those Four Dummies series of books? Yeah, absolutely. I, I picked up Personal Finance for Dummies for some strange reason. And um, got interested in personal finance, started fixing up my own personal finance life, and then I bought a house. And that's why I was, I was reading that type of stuff. And then long story short, because it was at the beginning of the boom, that house or condo that I bought, uh, I closed on it in like February of 02, maybe 03, but I think it was 02. And then three months later, uh, three or four months later, the condo next door, same floor plan, different building, sold for 30 grand more. Whoa. And I asked my pops, um, what does that mean? And he said, you made $30,000. I said, what do you mean I made $30,000? He explained the concept of equity, which uh, I had no idea what that was. 
And then he said, get your butt up, go to the library. That's what we used to do back in the day, is go to the library and learn. Um, so I literally went to the public library, sat down for eight hours, probably read eight books in a nine hour period, front to back, never left the library, just drank water the whole time. because I was so confused by the notion. And then by the end of the year, probably within the next year, I had bought 10 more places. Because my thought was, my thought was, you told me, me, little inner city dude from Boston who doesn't have two pennies to pinch, you just told me that I made 30 grand and that's someone's salary. So how do I do that multiple times over? So by the time I left the library, I figured that out. And then, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the arc of real estate started. Wow. Yeah. 10 properties in a year. That's, that's aggressive. So yeah. that sounds like one of the defining moments in your life. Um, you, you made money without doing anything except owning an asset. Can you yep. think of maybe two or three more of those? Give us a little more yeah. of your context. Yeah, so defining moments. So owning those assets was a defining moment for sure because my, my thought was if I buy these things and I pay them off, then I'll be able to replace my salary and then I'll be in control of whatever it is I want to do. And that was, that was just the thought process I had when I was 23. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, so that was definitely a defining moment. The other thing was, and I don't want this to be all about real estate and money and all that type of stuff. I started to figure some stuff out. One of the other defining moments was when I was 15, my parents sent me overseas to France with an exchange student who had just stayed at my house um, the previous summer. So he came, uh, hung out at my high school with me for two months, lived at our house and stuff. And then my pops had the wherewithal to send me back over there and I stayed with his family. Well, the thing was, uh, so I don't know, I can't remember what year this was, I think 94, 95, um, I'm, I'm sorry, 90 or 91. The thing was his, his dad um, says, hey man, get your stuff. I had been there for three days. You, you talking about a brother from, from, from Boston being told to grab your stuff and put it in a car. I didn't trust him at all, <laughs> <laughs> at all. And my mom, I call my mom on the phone and my mom, I'm Haitian. My mom is a little Caribbean woman, 5'5 five, five in stature and 120 pounds wet if she's lucky. And she pretty much said, you know, get your shit together, um, grab your stuff, put it in that man's car. What would you like me to do? There's nothing I can do. Use your common sense and you'll be fine. So thank God I did because this gracious and courageous man drove me and his son around France for 30 days in an old 83 Range Rover. I'll never forget it. Um, I experienced uh, staying in castles and a French wedding, French funerals, hit the Boy Scouts, met some girls, drank wine, uh, smoked a little weed back in the day. You know, all these types of things that we, we um, especially the people that I was growing up with and um, seeing in Boston, like, I, I didn't even know different experiences existed, right? So I'm completely gracious to that family. Matter of fact, I just surprised him after 15 years and popped up at his house on Father's Day in June just to say what's up to him back in France. So that'd be the second um, heavy moment because it showed me that I need to travel the world and experience stuff, which I hope we talk about a little bit later. I'm 95 countries in now at this point. And then the third one would be I was at the office for my consulting firm and I've told this story to other people I had just had my first son I was 25 years old uh, his mom needed to go to work or somewhere so she dropped my son off at the office with me in his baby carrier and I think he was like eight months or nine months or something and I thought I'd be at the office for an hour and then a manager comes out at 4 30 and pretty much puts stuff on my desk and says I need this done today and I looked at it and I said this is five six hours of work She's like, yeah, I know, but I, I needed to, to, to get done. And she walked away. So here I am being told by someone that, hey, I don't give a crap that you have your son here in a baby carrier, but we got to get this work done. And um, you can imagine my thought process after that day of that's never going to happen to me ever again. 
And uh, you and I have talked. You know how I feel about uh, necessarily people directing what I need to do. Um, so that never happened. So those are the three moments. My dad and the equity conversation, um, being exposed to international life, and then uh, kind of being told what to do where it impacted my family and um, day to day. So that's not happening again. So you slid that one in pretty smooth. You said you're 95 countries in. <laughs> what does that mean? That means I have a definition to it. That means that I have spent, if I say I've been to a country, that means that I have spent at least two weeks in some significant capacity in that country, meaning working, living, traveling, connecting, making friends. Um, that, that's my definition, but it's, it's 95 and then probably over 220 times at this point. Wait, 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 hold on. So you're telling me that I, I'm not good at math. So I'm around 95 to 100 and then I'm going to multiply it by two, right? So that, that's 200 weeks outside of the U.S. is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah, easily. Yeah. And then you said back in the day too, like you're not, you're not 45, you're not 60, like, <laughs> you're in your early 40s, man. What do you mean back in the day, first off? And then second of all, how do you get 200 weeks out the country at such a young age? You will, I have figured this out as well. You will make time for the things that matter to you, period. You'll find a way. If you, if you choose to do other things because society tells you that that is the most important then that that's on you what i figured out when i was 15 and for some reason i wrote a journal i don't even know why i did that i had never written a journal ever but somehow i found it a few years later and i've scanned it and i read it from time to time i remember how i felt when i was meeting different people and different cultures and eating different food and stuff like that so i've made it a priority um, between military service and purposefully asking for international assignments from the firm that I, that I work for, or um, taking unpaid leaves of absences because uh, experiences are more important than money, in my, my opinion. Um, I always find a way. And even now, I think this year alone, I've been to Finland three times, um, Turkey twice, I just got back from Lake Como in Italy for three weeks. Um, it's not a matter of how much time do you have. It's a matter of how do you organize your life such that these types of priorities happen. And I know they take money, of course, to do these types of things. I'm a bit of a travel hacker, using miles and points and all those types of things to get things done. But I have kind of created this elaborate system of how I can travel, when I can travel, and all those types of things. That's impressive. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's probably my, of all the things that I'm involved in, that is the most valuable because that's what's driving most of the uh, life-changing experiences, like meeting people and connecting. And it's even in a business sense, too. O overseas, I'll get into conversations and, um, you know, discuss ideas with people and all that type of stuff. But I love that aspect of life. So, do you know any other languages? Because, I mean, you're talking about being away and actually having the cultural experience. You're not just going yeah. and sitting on the reservation. So, how are you, how are you uh, existing in these other countries? Yeah, and when you say reservation, I don't do, I purposefully don't do tour, tourist stuff. Don't get me wrong, I'll go see the Louvre in Paris and I'll go see certain things in Rome or something. But my definition of a successful trip is if when I roll out, I know the, 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 the local grocery store owner or the bar owner, the, 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 the marina guy and I are friends, or I know my neighbors or something like that. That's, that's the definition of a um, uh, successful trip to me. So it's not like rolling out and just sitting somewhere and doing my ties. Uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm Haitian. So my family spoke, I didn't learn English till I was six or seven, according to my mom. And uh, they spoke Creole and French in the house. I picked them up. 
they were my first language. I, I was told I had an accent, and then over the years, that joint just dropped. Now I'm just a good old American. Um, and then over the years, I picked up Portuguese just because it's very similar. Uh, that's when I was spending a lot of time in Brazil. Um, I just picked it up as a language, and it stuck. So now I got uh, Creole, French, Portuguese, and obviously English. Wow. So I love international travel. Where is the favorite place that you've been? I think it varies depending on where you are in your life's arc. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like when it was my younger days, I was all about Mexico. And then uh, eight years ago, I did Yacht Week in Croatia, um, which was madness. Um, this past January, I went up into the Arctic Circle in Finland just because I just wanted to do some different stuff and go dog sledding and learn about life and what people do up there. You know what I mean? Um, I have one of those uh, wall maps where I put pins on it and I'll find the most random place and go there, you know. Um, but I'd probably say the, the one that's been the most impactful is Turkey. I worked there. I was doing some stuff for the military there back in 2015, made some amazing friends. And then, you know how people talk about different places on the media and it's just, oh, you can't go there. You, That's a horrible place. You should never. Yeah, Man, I went to I'm Egypt. So understood that country so, so bad. I have had so many wonderful experiences there. I know a ton of people. The Turkish Riviera crushes the Caribbean in terms of beauty and uh, what's available and what have you. And I've spent a lot of time in the Riviera. Um, so by far, probably Turkey at this point, but I'm kind of interested in Scandinavia right now because I haven't been to Norway. So that's next on the list. Wow. That's a rich experience, man. Um, Thanks. So what's most important to you, Maurice? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> and this will probably get back into the real estate um, domain a bit. I, I am not a, a, a money person. I'm a being in control and um, grabbing your own destiny kind of person. So the most important thing to me has been financial freedom and the ability to control time. So I, and I think I mentioned this to you before. One of my favorite books is Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Um, I picked it up. Man, I'm I'm gonna say it's maybe ten years ago now, ten, nine, eight years ago. And from that, there's an equation in that book that talks about freedom equals time plus mobility. And that equation has stuck with me like nobody's business. Um, time is our most valuable asset, right? Great. The way you can create time is with passive income because if you have passive income, then you don't need to be in any particular place at any particular moment because checks are showing up. You know what I mean? Um, so I focus on passive income. I focus on that equation. And you, you know, but I've done single family houses since '02 and got myself to a point where I had a rack of them paid off and they were, they were paying the bills. And then I switched to apartment buildings and mobile home parks four years ago. And that has gone extremely well um, we're, to the point where I'm switching over into kind of legacy mode and what I'm going to leave for the kids and all that type of stuff. Um, but like it's for importance, it's freedom. So if, if freedom equals time plus mobility, we just talked about the time component, right? Passive income. Right. Uh, by the way, passive income and organizing your regular careers, because I, I do work. I, I do have active income. But I have active income in a manner that's befitting of what I want life to be. So for both of my active employers, it's about outcome. It's not about how much time I spend in any particular office or whatever. And I think that's a conversation maybe for a different podcast for you. But I don't know where we got into this notion that ADOP, you must work from nine to five to be productive in life. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You, you should be focusing on outcomes for whoever you work for and ask that person, um, as long as I get you these outcomes, are you pleased? And that's kind of what I did. Um, so you can create time by, by focusing on outcomes on your regular careers, creating passive income through real estate and other businesses. I'm in the restaurant business as well, and I have a few restaurants. Um, the mobility piece is the one that's sneaky, and I, I really love this part of it. So, Jerome, you and I live in our homes and um, 
have all these responsibilities that exist where we, where we live, right? That's correct. Okay. One of the biggest things that holds us down is our physical home, our physical items that we have, clothes, cars, houses, the mail you have to deal with every day, all those types of things. Four Hour Work Week and some other books I got into talk about how to kind of free yourself from all those things. So I, I don't get mail in any particular place. Everything goes to Earth Class Mail, which is an online portal. Then I can sort through my business mail and my personal mail whenever I, whenever I want. So no mail comes to me. If, if something comes in the mail that I need to physically get, then I can forward it to wherever I am and it'll, it'll arrive. Um, I do have a car, but like I was telling you the other day, not interested in keeping it <laughs> at all. Um, but but I'll, I'll ride that joint till the wheels fall off. I'm probably going to give it to my 19-year-old at some point because Uber is available, Zipcar is available. Of course, it's dependent on where you live, but I live in the city, so I can get to any vehicle at any time. It's not a problem. Um, and then in general, I'm somewhat of a kind of a minimalist, but meaning I just don't buy a lot of stuff. I'm just not interested because anytime you bring this, actually, this is a good one. Everybody says, Hey man, why don't you bring me, um, why don't you bring me a souvenir when you come back or something like that? Absolutely not. Because here's the thing about stuff. All right. If you accept something from someone, so Jerome is, Jerome is my boy, and he said, hey, man, it was great to meet you, man. I got a gift for you. Here's five wine glasses. Okay. If I accept that, then what I've done is accepted that – or what I've done is accepted debt, meaning at some point I'm going to have to deal with those five wine glasses. What the heck am I going to do with that at some point? We accept all these things into our lives, and I'm not saying don't accept some of it because some of it's important. There's a certain – stack of books that I keep. I will never let them go. Um, certain, I guess, pictures I'll never let go um, or awards from the military that actually mean something to me. But in general, I just don't keep a lot of stuff, which means at any given point, I can get up and go and grab my little one. I have a 19 year old and a six year old, grab my little one and the missus and pick up. And that's what we did when we went to Lake Como. We just rolled out for two and a half, three weeks and we could manage our lives from a distance. And that's just a beautiful thing. It's freedom. Yeah. So freedom equals time plus mobility. And I am hyper serious about that equation. And uh, it kind of uh, drives a lot of the things that I do. So the lifestyle you've been able to create is probably second to none. What are the three biggest lessons that you've learned on this journey to this place of freedom? <clears throat> by far the biggest one is you have a choice. It's a choice, man. I know it's hard and I'm sitting here and folks are like, what? He did, he did this, he did that. that. That's just too much. Well, it's a choice. Um, when I did the whole single family racket, like I told you, I, I effectively gave up my 20s. I got up to 30, 35 single family homes between Southern Virginia in Northern Maryland up to the Delaware line. And on any given weekend, I was painting a wall, uh, plunging a toilet, getting rid of cockroaches or something. I was doing something related to my desire to be in control of my own life, right? So uh, all this stuff that we do, if you, want to, if you want to go party all the time, then go party all the time. If you want to um, create a business, then create a business. It is just a fundamental choice, right? And I'm trying to teach that. I've taught it to my 19-year-old. I'm teaching it to my six-year-old. We all have the power to make our own decision and live life the way that we want to live. I will tell you, we need money to do it. it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reality, okay? So find ways to generate money on your own. And frankly, the, the generation that exists today um, has so many tools you know, with, when it comes to the internet and all those types of things to generate cash, to be able to live the way that folks want to live. It's a, it's a choice, right? So I, I would say, um, just make a choice to do the types of things that you want to do, find ways to generate income and then do whatever it is. Gary Vaynerchuk says this all the time and he's, he's a bit of a lightning rod figure, but some things he says, I do like find something that you like to do and do that 
right? You don't have to fight. You don't have to do what society is telling you to do or chase titles or climb the corporate ladder. If, if it's, there's nothing wrong with it. If that's what you want to be a CEO of a company, but don't do that just because other people are doing that. Um, so I guess that would be the biggest thing is, you know, you, we, we all have a choice in this stuff and the way I choose to live my life and how much I've worked at it um, and make sure that I surround myself with people who've done bigger and better in the space that I'm interested in. It's all a choice. Wow. <clears throat> so that makes me think of the matrix, right? Uh, yeah. Hey, yo, oh, the choice. <laughs> That's what's up. Presents them. He presents them with the red and the blue pill and he chooses red. Um, and yeah. I think we all have those, those moments. Was there, was there a particular instance that showed you the power of choice? Since that's your biggest one? I don't think there was a, oh yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. It's the red pill moment. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I got one. You wearing a shirt, I just realized that. I know. Uh, and I'll freely say this because I usually don't talk about my corporate career, um, but I have been where I'm, where I'm at for 22 years. And I have been asked the question, hey man, are, are you gonna be partner or, or, or whatever? Something on the leadership side. And I have pur purposefully chosen to maintain, not maintain the level where I am, but I focus on outcomes as opposed to the titles. And here's why. If you are a partner at a firm or a law firm or whatever, it's, it's important and it's good, especially if that's your value and it means something to you and you worked your butt off. And I totally get that. But that's not a, a, a dream for me by any means. So um, I purposefully chose not to go a specific route to be able to have time outside of that work environment to be able to focus on other stuff. Now, if every once in a while, it's like, man, I should have went for partner. I should have done this. I should have done that. And then I realized with all the experiences that I've had, be it doing military, everywhere I've been for the military, because uh, I volunteer a lot, or all the travels that I've done, or the ability to take care of my kids, or because um, my oldest is, is autistic, so he's on a different traje trajectory, right? But he's doing really well. He's in college now. Um, that was a red pill, m blue pill moment for me of, you can go this route because that is what the corporate ladder is telling you to do, or you can focus on giving your boss and your customers and the people that work for me there, focus on outcomes that they need to get stuff done, such that you can go focus on other stuff as well. Um, so that's, that's the moment, right? Do I chase a title because that's what everybody else is doing, or do I structure life the way it makes the most sense for me. And um, that's what I did. And I'm still there. I don't have to be there. I choose to be there because I have customers that I love and that are my friends. My existing boss is a very smart person who understands you have to know what motivates people to make them work. And for some people, it ain't titles and money at all. For some people, they just want to make a difference. And then for others, it's titles and money, right? Um, yeah, that, that, that was the moment, right? That was, that was a red pill, blue pill, um, moment where I chose to go a different route. And man, I, I think I'm richer for it. I'm way richer in experiences than most. And, uh, I'm unapologetic about the way that I live. How long did it take you to get to that place where you became unapologetic about the way you live? Ooh, I, I think I'm probably more militant on it now. I'm probably more militant on it nowadays. Um, but I would say probably four or five years ago. Yeah. Because you do get pulled back and you do want to be a part of something bigger, which includes society, right? So it does pull you back a little bit where it's like, hey, man, you're not supposed to be doing this. Or your kids need to, you know, especially, uh, for real, for real, especially in the black community, hey, your kids need to be playing this sport, this sport, this sport, because in a lot of cases, that's a path out for uh, minority kids, right? That's just not my focus for my kids at the moment. Although my kids, my, both, of, both of them are playing sports, but I don't push it. And I played football in college and had one pro tryout. Um, it's just not interesting to me at all. What's interesting to me is giving them 
the experiences that I've had. So my oldest has been to 12 countries so far. My youngest is on his fifth or sixth country already. And when he was in Italy, for example, the last go round, uh, once or twice picked up his iPad, but was asking questions about language and about their food and about how come the cars are smaller than the cars in, in the US and the buses are different. The metro system is different. Like he's super curious now about the world and that's, that's what I wanted, right? Um, Spark the interest. Yeah, yeah, and I, that, that, that's, a big, that's a big deal. So I, I, I think I have made a good decision for my own personal life, but it's a personal decision. Everybody's gotta figure out what matters to them, and that's what I'm trying to get across on this podcast, I guess, is you, I'm gonna say one more thing real quick, cause I know I've been long winded, but Jerome, if we, on average, we, we're gonna live 28,000 days. A friend of mine in Costa Rica gave me this sheet of paper years ago. On average, we live 28,000 days, assuming we live to 79, okay? That means that by the time you hit 40, you're on the downside of it. So I have roughly 12,800 and some odd days left, depending. When you look at your life and days as opposed to that abstract number of years because it feels so long, then you start to realize you have a finite amount of time to get certain things done and to be happy, right? Right. So I look at that. And um, if I got 12,000 left, then I'm going to do those 12,000 the way that I want to. And I'm going to make sure that my kids have the options to do things the way that they want to as well and give them awareness. So... When we talked the other day, you mentioned doing some homeschooling this fall and being yeah. out of country for a while. You mind talking about that a little bit and why you're taking that approach? Yeah, no problem. So, I mean, it's dependent. I, gotta, I have to do some ne- internal home negotiating with the missus, of course. But my goal this, um, this fall is to pick up. So my 19-year-old is in college. He's doing his own thing. That's fine. But for my six-year-old and for my family, one of the things that I want to do is get us back overseas and live um, probably for a month or two, likely in Croatia again. We, we lived in Croatia for a while, but we had such a good experience there, and I think there were some things we could have done better, so I want to do it again. So obviously people will say, hey, uh, what about your kid going to school and how are you doing this? So you pick up the phone. You don't, if you don't ask the question, the answer is no. So I don't understand why people don't just ask. You pick up the phone, you work with the school system, negotiate what uh, educational outcomes need to occur, um, find a way to make it happen, we'll get that done, and then he can go back to school when we come back. The way that, the way that I look at it is that the education system is pretty much the same since the 1920s. They go into a class, they sit down at a desk, and they read, and it's just nonsense. The structure, what, we need education. I'm just talking about the structure itself because my parents are educators and um, I'm glad that they were lifelong educators. Um, But what I saw, the way that I saw my son grow in just three weeks of travel was insane. So if we go back and we immerse ourselves and I can work on my business during the early morning and the late night and then spend time with my son and his mom and we can connect better as a family and then he develops as a person way better in in the scheme of things. So I'm, I'm pushing that and I'm just going to just pull him from school for a little while, but we'll get the educational stuff done as well. Yeah. I think that's such a refreshing perspective, right? He doesn't have to. And I mean, you're teaching him what you learned in your late teens, early twenties. I don't have to be in a specific place in order to execute on whatever the outcomes are. Um, no, that's and there is a community and family like that, Jerome. Um, like on Facebook, there is a group called the World Schoolers. I'm not as heavy into it as those folks are. Eh, I don't want to say that, that because that, uh, that stereotypes the group. I'll, I'll just say that there's a, there's a group of, there's a community that recognizes that the world can teach us a lot of things. Um, so I, I love being connected to those types of people who think differently. Uh, just because it's set up. Hey guys, back in 2016, me and the team decided to formalize Dreamcatchers as an organization that can help people achieve their wildest dreams. If this is you, please visit our website at dreamshouldbereal.com in order to find out the details of our services and how we can help you become a Dreamcatcher. Talk to you soon. And here's the thing about kids and 
the way we grew up, Jerome, which was first grade, get excited, go to second grade, get excited, go to third grade, fourth grade, junior high, high school. Man, I got to get into college now. That's the next thing I'm supposed to do. You get into college. Oh, I got to go get that corporate career. That's the next thing I'm supposed to do. You do that. Man, I got to get me a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You, you, you make that happen. Got to get married now because that's what everybody else is doing. You do that, and then you end up having two and a half kids, a white picket fence, and a dog. And you're in debt and broke. Nonsense. It's complete <laughs> nonsense. You don't and believe in the fairy tale, huh? There's no fairy tale. That's, that's all marketing, and that's a ploy. It's all marketing and a ploy. Fam- family is the fairy tale, but not the way we've been taught to necessarily structure it. Having family is the most beautiful thing in the world, Expand but getting that. into debt and all those things is, not, is total bull. Total. We've just been taught that way. That's what we were taught to do. And that's why I'm going back to what you said, which is, well, you asked me a question. I said, it's all a choice. If you want to go uh, impress your friends and because your girlfriend or, or, your, or your boy got married and you get married because it seems like the right thing to do and whatever, that's, that's your choice. If you um, want to experience life in a different way, and it doesn't have to be travel. I, I'm stuck on travel because it's valuable to me. But it could be pottery. It could be running around the U.S. It could be playing sports. It could be immersing in a language. Do it. Do it different. Whatever so, makes you happy. So what – tell me uh, your views, if you don't mind, on family. Because you, you're, you started to make a pretty important distinction there, right? Because being married doesn't mean that you have a family. And so – Dive deep on that for me, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I might get myself into a little <laughs> bit of hot water, though. But I'll go ahead and do it. Um, I, I don't like the notion. I'm not interested in the notion that uh, being married or having a governmental bond, if you will, right? Like having a marriage certificate means that you are all of a sudden a family. It's, it's a contract. It's You're signing a contract. Yeah, it's a total contract. I, so for folks out there who are like, ah, this dude, I'm not suggesting that being in a couple is, is um, an issue. That's right. perfect. What I'm suggesting is I can't tell you how many of my boys and girlfriends, um, girls who are friends, I've seen jump into marriage just as the next thing to do. And it ends up eventually, 18 years later, you're, you're sitting down looking in the mirror thinking, how did I even get here, right? So um, that is not, I guess what I'm saying is that is not family. Family is um, connecting in a family unit, spending time with those that you love. And I'm not just talking about blood family, I'm talking about friends and people that you have common experiences and common bonds with. To me, that's family. And one of my goals nowadays, Jerome, because I've spent so much time on, so much time on uh, solidifying my financial and business life. Now I'm spending a lot of time on solidifying relationships and experiences. You know what I mean? There are certain people, certain people in your life will fall off. Certain new people will come into your life because you have like values. Um, you and I are kicking in a little bit, right? Because we, we, we've talked about a few things and stuff. I'm more on spending time with those folks and building stronger bonds than I am on the, on the ladder. Well, I'm just going to go uh, do what other families do and, and play the part. I just, I, I don't believe in that. I'm not interested in it. Um, and it's, frankly, it's just a waste of time. I love it. Yeah. So, so you gave me the one big lesson. I don't know if you have any more, but I just want to circle back to that and see if you had any more to share with us. Because, I mean, you've, you've done so much. It's just... If you could save somebody from making a mistake in real estate or in the second lesson might be, you know, the whole thought on partnering and relationships and mating and how oh, yeah. that fits yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, I think that one of the biggest things that I'll put out there is to just be aware of your limiting beliefs, right? The stuff that holds you back. Uh, when I started switching into the commercial game four or five years ago, I kept 
pulling myself back into a single family space because I just didn't think that that was supposed to be me out there. Um, and I think you know the story, but I started looking at apartment buildings and mobile home parks in late, late 16. It wasn't until early 18 or late 18, late 17 that I had a meeting with a mentor of mine. And then, you know, uh, in a year and a half time frame, I had closed on six apartment buildings and mobile home parks. And I'm have working on a contract on a seventh that um, is 400 units, right? Um, the only thing that kept me from jumping into that joint earlier was myself. I was like, I can't, there's no way I can do this. Um, but now here's the thing. We will go out and spend 50 grand, right, to go to whatever university to Come go on. get a history degree. Come on. This is comical, brother. Come That's on. what we'll do. Oh, I got to get this diploma. Kanye West said it, said it best, didn't he? I got to go out and get this diploma. All you're going to do is sleep under that thing sometimes. But we'll go out and spend 50 grand to get that. Come on. But we won't take 50 grand to go educate ourselves on something like commercial investing or something that puts money in your pocket from a passive income perspective, right? Because it gives you the power to make choices. So I figured that out. And probably over the last year, I went, probably over the last year, I probably spent probably 60 or 75 grand in educating myself through seminars, books, flying to see potential mentors, having conversations. And that has paid my family and my kids' legacy over some hundred times already, right? I don't know what it is about, I do know what it is. It's marketing. It's what we were told to do. We were told to go to college. We were told that's the only way to do things. We were told you must have a degree. I would love for my kids to go to, my, my oldest is in college now on a different track, an alternative path than getting a degree, but he is in college. My six-year-old, I talk to him about this stuff all the time. I don't talk about uh, The Simpsons. I talk about business and his life and what he wants just so he keeps hearing it from me. He has a choice. Dad is not expecting him to be a football player. Dad is not expecting him to go to college. I am expecting him to generate passive income so he has choices and we'll, we'll get that done. So in answer to your question about like what can you tell people, like don't have limiting beliefs um, at all. Spend on your education, right? You, that's an investment in yourself. Nobody can take that knowledge back from you. As my boy tells me, one of my primary partners, he says, Maurice, you know too much now. You can't, go, you can't even go back, can you? Because I was talking about um, the military and I'm retiring from the military this year after 22 years. And I was having some emotional challenges with it because I, I love service and things of that nature. But it, it's too much of a draw on my time when I'm trying to do other stuff. So he goes, brother, the problem is you know too much already. You have educated yourself so much that you recognize that if you spend one hour here, it'll create this outcome. If you spend one hour over there, it's just busy work. So w which hour do you actually want to spend, right? It's all about education. Um, so education, 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 and don't allow limiting beliefs to hold you back, man, because if I did, there's no way I would be on this trajectory that I've started. Um, well, back in 02, when my dad told me something, and then four years ago when I started getting in, into commercial. And it's, it's big. And then I have a goal, Jerome, which is by the time probably in my 70s, or maybe late, probably early or mid-70s, I'm going to write a $50 million check to some charitable cause somewhere because that is, you know how uh, Bill Gates and, and um, Bill Gates, Melinda, Buffett, all those guys, they yeah. have the giving punch? Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> Maurice, well, you can just go volunteer your time right now. But here's the thing. If I volunteer too much right now, then I'm taking time away from building a legacy and a brand and a mass amount of resources that I can write a check for and move a country or move a market. You know what I mean? So I sit on nonprofit boards and I do volunteer from time to time, but my time is more valuable building what I'm building because I'm going to change something dramatically. It's just a matter of when I get there because the kids ain't getting everything. The world is going to get a large piece of it. $50 million? <laughs> Come on. 50 million, and I hope I 
exceed that. Um, it, Jerome, and the reason why I say 50, and like, well, spend some of it. I told you this yesterday, and I, I, I would like folks on the podcast to hear this as well, or to see this as well. Tim Ferriss says in that book, and I keep going back to it because it has um, been a foundation for me for a while. People, it, it's not that people want to be millionaires and billionaires. That's not it. It's right. that people want to have the lives that they think millionaires and billionaires live. And I had mentioned it to you, whether you have 5 million or 50 million, generally your lifestyle is going to be the same. Generally. Whether you have 500 grand or 5 million, generally you can keep your lifestyle the same. It's a matter of how many expenses you don't allow yourself to have. You don't need to go out and buy 10 Mercedes. It's stupid. It's stupid. Um, so, man, you're going to spend all that money and give it back? Yeah, because I'm probably living life in a way that most billionaires and millionaires don't have the ability to because they're spending their time doing maybe nonsense in a lot of ways where I focus on getting experiences and connecting with the right people and having fun. Um, so yeah, I want to write a $50 million check one day. It's just a personal goal for myself. Whether I get there or not, that's irrelevant. I'm writing a large check to someone, but I, but don't get me wrong. I still volunteer today and do nonprofit work. And, but I just, no one in my immigrant family has had their name slapped on something as a bit of legacy for my kids to keep on when I'm gone. And that's the goal at this point. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Just <laughs> away. Nah, that's, that's big. And so it's interesting. You said, look, I spent 60 to 75 grand in education over the past year to 18 months. And that's resulted yeah. in a hundred fold return. Like you're, yeah. Yeah. you're dealing with big numbers and then you go on to say, Hey, I'm not going to keep all this for myself or my family. We're going to impact the world in a big way. That's I, major. Yeah. It's a dude. I, and if money was the goal and not to get all morbid and stuff, because I adored him. If money was the goal then Robin Williams would still be alive. Period. I tell everybody that, that, that phrase, if money was the goal, cause Robin had 350 million of them, he'd be alive. And unfortunately he, I don't know what happened with him. And if he, obviously he wasn't happy in some form of capacity because maybe he was focusing on the wrong things or too many crabs in a barrel. I, I, I have no idea. You don't need a ton of money to be happy. You don't but you can use money and those resources to affect other people's lives in a very meaningful way. And that is kind of my focus right now. Um, but one more thing, a friend of mine who I was doing condo investing with back in the day, I helped him buy four condos cause I was really, really good at it. And I helped him pay off those four condos using some strategies that I had figured out. So he paid off those four condos, those four condo, three of, three condos, those three condos pay him four grand a month in general. Okay. Uh, rather than subscribing to what we are doing here, he focused on his happiness. He picked up, grabbed his girlfriend who is now his wife moved to Thailand and I, he's still bartending in Thailand, but he lives a lifestyle that everybody here is in some cases saying, man, I got to be the president. So one day I can go live in Thailand and be a bartender. Well, you can do that now if you really, really want to. It's a, it's a choice. So money, money is not the end all be all. Uh, no hearse, no, no armored car is going to follow that hearse to the cemetery at all. Find a way to do something big with it. And um, that'll help you sleep better into the eternal life. And it helps me go to bed every night. Wow. So if you had a time machine. Yeah. Is there something you would go back and redo or change? No. The only thing I can conceive is that I would have started commercial investing earlier because it's moving me towards my goal at a much more rapid pace than the single family stuff that I was doing. Um, 
as well, the only other thing I can think of, that notion of you are the average of the five people around you, right? Yeah, that's for real. That is very real. And I was focused on the wrong things back in the day, okay? Um, focusing on having the clean car driving down the street, right? Instead of picking up books and things of that nature. That's the only thing I can come up with. But man, I'm, where I have ended up, the fact that I'm sitting here speaking on my first podcast to you, and I kid you not, I put it out into the universe probably seven months ago. I met um, Soledad O'Brien on, on the set of her talk show. And I asked her, how do I get the message out there? And she gave me some tidbits about public speaking and getting my message out there about freedom and passive income and controlling your own destiny. And no shit, here I am talking to you on a podcast, hopefully getting a bit of the message out. So I absolutely would never want to go back and redo things. I would just want to tweak things or start things a little bit earlier. But frankly, I'm going to hit my goals no matter what. Um, I just want to be able to impact people and give them some hope in what they're trying to get accomplished as well. Major. So yeah. I like to wrap up with two questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is, what are you most grateful for? What am I most grateful for? Uh, shoot. Have to be my parents, right? My family is an immigrant family. They came over from Haiti back in the 70s. Granddad was run out of the country by the dictator, who, who uh, he was on the bad side of that dictator. So he had to leave the country. And he left his private school business that he had built up and had nothing, right? So they come to this country and they, all my parents knew how to do was to just make sure I get an education. That's why I'm saying education is important. So I wasn't, I wasn't um, you know, saying that education is not a staple. It is. But man, they pushed me from the foundational point of, dude, get your education and whatever else it is you want to do, we'll let you do it. Now, here's the thing. They didn't coddle me once. I remember to this day calling my mom when I was at University of Virginia because I had no money and I had something to figure out and, or I needed some money to figure some stuff out. And she said, baby, I ain't got it. You got to go figure that stuff out on your, on your own. And when you do, call me back and hung up the phone. Wow. And uh, she, she was not playing. Um, them pushing me out into the world, not coddling me, but at least giving me the base for education and then supporting the way that I am today. I am not interested in uh, appeasing or um, feeling good because of someone's acceptance, except my mother and father. That's it. Everybody else, I don't care if you're a billionaire, multimillionaire, baller, yoga instructor, whatever. I'm so uh, grounded in who I am, and I think that comes from those two people, that they are the only ones that I'll give credit of the day. So it's just those two. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. Um, so we're right at an hour. What... If, no, yeah. if they only listen to the next, you know, 30 seconds to two minutes, what is the one message yeah. or takeaway you want people to get? Take action on the type of life that you want to have, period. I, I don't, the way that I'm doing certain things is good for me and good for me only. Other people want to do other things in their life and sometimes they don't realize just by a few steps toward it or surrounding themselves with people who've already done that thing, they can get there. All of our dreams and stuff tend to get muted by all the noise that we have, right? Medicine is real because it blocks out all the noise that exists. Internet, TV, phones, Facebook, Instagram, all that type of stuff. You can take action towards whatever style of life you want to have and whatever it is that makes you happy and focus on that. If you focus on trying to make other people happy, doing things that they are telling you is the right thing to do, um, that's just gonna end up in a bad place. So if there's one thing I would tell people is whatever it is you think that makes you happy, create some passive income, go do that thing, focus on people who are supportive in that arena, 
and you'll get to where it is that you need to go for sure. And I love having those conversations, man. And um, I do it all the time on Instagram. So if anybody wants to chat on Instagram, I'm happy to do that. But um, yeah, just take action towards whatever it is that you want to do. Nice, nice. Guys, you heard it from the legend himself. <laughs> um, this was an amazing conversation. And so if you've made it to this point, uh, I think you probably agree with me. So do me a favor, give us a rating and review, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button on either your podcasting platform or YouTube. Maurice, I'm extremely grateful that you shared this time with us. I'm glad to be in the circle, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to looking forward to uh, growing this thing and you know taking down some more multifamily and learning about life and getting some rich experiences. We got to get down to Haiti soon, man. Yeah, man, absolutely. And 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 God bless for coming into my life path at the moment that you did, so I can do this and and put some wisdom out there to the extent possible. And here's the thing, because I'm learning, man. I'm because I spoke because I've had a couple of speaking engagements and I've had an opportunity to connect with people. Don't think for a second that I don't have things to learn, man. The more people I talk to, the more I learn about myself. Um, I love the opportunity to connect with people, help them, and then learn more about myself and grow. And we're all a family in this stuff. You just have to find the right people to connect with. So um, connect with me on Instagram, please, and let's have a conversation. If you want to learn more about Dreamcatchers, please visit the website at dreamsgivereal.com. If you can think of someone who would benefit from these types of opportunities and are willing to share what we're doing with them, we would greatly appreciate it. 